Uh, Tim, so now when it comes to this whole thing, what is, let's, can we set the context about what is innovation? How do you define innovation? Because for me, innovation has to tick three boxes. A, it has to solve a problem. B, it has to, whoever who's innovating has to find a unique solution to solve that problem. And number C, the, the problem and the unique solution is not good enough. Using that unique solution, can the innovator add value to the problem owner? Uh, this is my interpretation of uh, what innovation is. How does it uh, flow with your interpretation of uh, innovation? Yeah, I mean, very much aligned. And, and I think it is um, really important that the aligning and agreement within the team or within the organization is, is consistent. Um, and, and you touched on a few, a few points there in terms of, you know, really about um, understanding the problem and, and, and the value aspect. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one of the, the definitions that, that we use is that innovation delivers uh, new and measurably better solutions to problems that are worth solving. Um, and the, the reason that we, we, we constructed it in, in this way is that it, it taps on much of what you've just said. You know, it's, it's, um, it needs to look at um, delivering a solution, but to a real problem, to a problem that okay. is worth solving. And the other important aspect is it, it needs to actually deliver. If it remains as an idea, we all have these bright ideas, uh, um, you know, throughout our lives, we, we come up with a great idea for solving something. Um, but unless we can actually deliver a solution to, you know, based on that idea, it remains an idea. Um, so innovation requires delivery. Um, and then we also added this, this sense of it being measurably better. Uh, you need to know what the problem is now, and you need to know whether what you have done has made a difference or not. So there is a form of measurement that needs to, to be in there. Um, and then lastly, it's this, this sense of it delivering something that's new. Okay. Um, if it's something that has been done before, um, that isn't necessarily a bad thing, but then we would wonder whether it's truly innovative. And, and I think that the, the discussion is more around, does it be completely new or can it mm. have an, one element that is new? And I think as long as there is an element that is new so that the solution is unique and new, then yeah. I think that, that helps define it as innovation. I believe it's uh, the, the solution must be unique to the customer. So the or the value proposition or the, the value that the customer sees, the utility that the customer sees. We will be using this term uh, value proposition a lot. Uh, so the value proposition has to be different. And then sometimes uh, we, um, I, Tim, I believe uh, you're also familiar with the concept of repurposing. So that means you get something that has been already there, but any of that you could apply in a new context, in a new value proposition. Um, does it um, resonate uh, with your ideology of innovation? Absolutely. I think that that um, that cross pollination, uh, you know, taking something that exists in in one sector or, or in in one um, other discipline and and taking elements of that and bringing it into your sector or that's for your users your customers um that's that's absolutely where most of the, the the breakthrough ideas come from there are very few original original ideas but what there are are original combinations of ideas right so, so i think that's that's an element uh one of the key things that we have, we have seen when it comes to innovation is that a lot of people are thinking about uh, look if i have a cool idea if i have this some bright spark idea with a bright spark it is innovation and then ultimately most of those uh, innovative initiatives fail uh, because that it's not addressing the right level of uh, problem solving um, so i believe that is an area that we need to focus on uh, in a little while um, so mm -hmm. how can we start digging deep into this space well i think you know, to continue um, on that point about making sure that everyone is aligned on innovation, I think that really is an essential foundation that needs to be established. And one, one way that we, we can help that conversation um, with, with any of our clients is to, to just have a look at what um, initiatives are going through the, the organization at, at the current time. 
um, whether they be a product company or whether they be a service company. Um, I think having a look at all the projects and, and helping categorize them in some ways um, can help with that conversation around, okay, what are we really tackling here? And um, what we, we've proposed here are these innovation positioning levels. And just to be very clear, if you are at the, the, um, the, the lower level here of, a, of adjust um, versus the, the, the top level of pioneering, this isn't a scale of value. Uh, in, in fact, <laughs> the value may well be uh, in, inverted in that most businesses, most teams will be operating uh, well in this, this lower portion, these gray, gray bands. Okay. Because that, that's where the capabilities and the expertise lies. So that's what a company needs to recognize um, and, and definitely uh, keep hold of. But the, topper, the top area, the blue area, this is where we start asking questions beyond what we know. And I think when we move beyond what we know how to do or we know what the answers are, that's where we move into the innovation space and, and, and becomes really interesting to explore and complement the work that is happening in, the, in that, that gray area. Yeah, so because that from my perspective that you could uh, innovate at your product level, your service level, your internal process, but in the same time, the higher level of value addition is that when you can go and uh, innovate at the value proposition level or even go up to the level of innovating uh, your business model. So there are multiple layers which is pretty much in line with uh, this particular slide uh, of innovation positioning. So one of the critical factors is that for us to understand, okay, where our innovation efforts are lying. Um, one of the challenges would be we could uh, get some of the innovation products done at the bottom of the gray areas. But again, when it comes to the real uh, blue areas, um, are tougher, harder, and it needs a lot of energy to push things through. Um, you would, would you like to explore more on the same line, sir, Tim? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you touched on something really uh, important there, that um, innovation isn't just about product innovation. Innovation can be, mm. a, a, you know, completely revisiting your business model as a whole, or it can fall somewhere in between, which is revisiting some of the processes that you use internally or with your partners. Um, so I think that, that that's a really important point for, for people to, uh, to take away is innovation does not equal product technical newness, as it were. Um, so, yeah, I think the um, I mean, just to, 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 to touch on that point as well, in terms of what are the objectives for trying something new? Um, and, and I think, you know, what, what we've done is we've, we've just had a quick look at overlaying some of the the objectives here which is if if an organization wants to remain category competitive they can do so by 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 sort of fluctuating in the in the, the, the that gray band continuing to deliver something that is familiar in the market it's maybe that organization's version of something that already exists from a competitor but maybe tweaked in a way that has some of the the brand qualities of this this new co your company um, and maybe you just dip into exploring a little bit in the in the incremental innovation space where you're you're offering something new um, for your company. You, your company has not seen how to do this before, and you're experimenting a little bit. That is 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 um, absolutely uh, a very robust space to be, and you can be competitive operating in that space. However, as a company, if you look to to lead in the category then this is where you need to be prepared to, to, to move that bar up higher. And as you, you mentioned, this will involve looking at different business models. This will involve looking at uh, different manufacturing or process um, methods, possibly new materials, new partners. So a lot of newness comes into to this uh, ambition to lead. It's very difficult to lead if you continue doing something that you've always done and all your competitors are doing as well. So that's, that's where it's, it's important to just overlay where are you as an organization wanting to play and where are you prepared to put your efforts to uh, be successful in, in that space? Yeah. Uh, I believe, Tim, uh, with my experience with working with a um, multitude of apparel manufacturing entities, uh, most of the apparel manufacturing entities are fantastic when it comes to innovating at the gray spaces. Uh, but um, 
the the challenge is to go and work with the the brands on the high levels uh, so it's a tough thing it's not easy it's not that they are used to it's all about that you got to at a certain level the brands might be say yes if you want to do that you might have to prove your capabilities but i believe it is also more of a mindset that we need to work on um, and yeah uh, for all the uh, participants who are here with us today we are having this chat with uh, mr tip shop who has been working with uh, speedo and pentland brand uh, the giant uh, apparel sorry apparel giant uh, as the director of innovation who has been there and worked with many of the some of the initiatives that has gone through with speedo and pentland brands and then uh, we all the the slides that you see would be given to you at the end of the program most probably by tomorrow morning uh, we will be sharing you the slides we will be sharing you the uh, um, the the link with the recording if you think that your colleagues may have missed the webinar or else that is there another colleague that who may have not uh, seen it yet um, it's worthwhile for them to see you can share the link so that you could do that uh, uh, tip now when it comes to this sort of a thing we spoke about um, bringing in innovation is all about sorting problems um, how can we make an entry uh, particularly for most of the apparel manufacturing companies, uh, uh, the, some of the we have here a lot of senior managers, we have a lot of uh, senior leadership uh, team members like the directors or the GMs or the CEOs, um, particularly looking at a more of a different perspectives to innovation than just doing tweaks to in some of the gray areas, how can they approach this problem? Yeah, yeah, great. Um, so I, I think the, the the first um point uh, as uh, you know we've just discussed in terms of that aligning on on innovation then i think it's about really understanding where do you find uh the the value propositions that are going to be uh enabling you to innovate successfully and um i think it's worth uh just just re replaying a little bit the, the this venn diagram that is very popular in innovation circles mm. which is the, the three core components to delivering innovation. One of them is to, to, to understand the user. So in this case, this is usually the end user your, or your customer. Um, what is it that they really need? What, what are they struggling with right now? What, what problems do they face? What can they not do? What do they wish they could do? And so this isn't just about understanding who they are and creating a demographic. This is about understanding the challenges and aspirations that they, the, that audience faces. The, the next fear then is, is understanding the technology that is available. And this may be a new technology or it may be well-established technology, or as we discussed earlier, maybe a combination of existing technologies, but in a new way, whatever it might be, you need to understand this technology sphere to, to, to know what is feasible in, in the space. And then lastly, the, the orange um, sphere there is, is the company. Every company, every organization is, is slightly different. It will have uh, different capabilities. It will have different purposes. It will have different objectives, different heritages. You need to understand really the, the who is the company and what are the ambitions of the company. Sometimes this is phrased as desirability, feasibility, and viability. Um, I think it's because of all of the illities at the end of it, it makes it ring nice and, and simple. But, you know, I also like the fact that it's, it's summing up that, that's, that sense of desirable um, and, and not just from, oh, that, that looks attractive, but actually, no, what, do, what does a user really desire? What is it that they really wish was resolved? So that's, that's desirability. And then the technology aspect in terms of feasibility, the reason I like that is that it's saying, okay, well, what is possible? What is actually feasible in, in the world today to enable us to address and deliver that desirability? And then lastly, the viability, and, the, and some people confuse viability and feasibility. And I think viability is really to do with, does it make sense for this company, your company, to actually do this project? It may be right for another company to do, but if it's not right for you to do, then that's something that needs to be re really well uh, considered and, and taken into account before you embark on any new initiative. 
Um, the, 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 the problem with, with these three spheres is that um, most people, and I'd say most organizations, um, tend to look at it from, from their world outwards. Um, and this, this is just, I think, part of human nature. You know, we, we know our own world better than we know anyone else's world. Therefore, that's our starting point. That's our reference point. And what we do is we say our customers or our partners, and it's always starting with our or, or what can we do? Um, what can we offer? Um, and so it's a well-intended uh, or the intention is very good um, to say we, we're here to help, we're here to support, we're here to, to offer the solution. But by doing that, you're starting with what you know and what you're familiar with. And then you find users or you find technology. The real opportunity, however, is if you flip it around and say, well, actually, no, let's, let's first understand where the problems are and who have those problems and how big are those problems then looking at that technology and saying, okay, well, what, what technology, what, uh, what means do we have out there? Or maybe we don't have, maybe it just exists, but what options are there to address those needs? And then you bring it into the company to say, right, as a company, how can we tap into that technology? How can we use what's feasible to deliver solutions to those users? So it's, it's just flipping it around and putting the end users first and then figuring out how you can support them rather than take your expertise and, and um, know-how and pushing it out. It's, 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 it's flipping the model. And, and I think for, for uh, apparel manufacturers in particular, I think there's a real opportunity in this, this overlap between desirability and feasibility. I think the, 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 the manufacturers that I've worked with have an incredible expertise and, and infrastructure, um, you know, the, 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 the capex that is involved to produce uh, new ideas is, is, is huge. And, and manufacturers have these skill sets, but also have the, the resources to explore what is feasible. And I think that's the, 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 the significant shift. Rather than produce what you know you can produce, it, I think there's an opportunity of saying, how can we understand what needs are not being met work with the brands work with your 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 clients and say what is it that isn't being achieved well right now and then using all of the expertise and resources that sit within the manufacturing space to say let us explore together let us help you understand how we can develop some solutions to answer those needs so i think that's a fantastic opportunity for for, for manufacturers Oh, you're on mute, Rookie. My dogs are barking, so I decided to uh, mute it. <laughs> Sorry about it. Um, I believe one of the things that, uh, because that I have done many sessions with uh, apparel industry executives, um, we, with our experience, it had been looked at, we know what you know, and then we can we break it and then let's look at innovation and then most of the time we fail at understanding what is desired by the problem owner uh, so at a certain level based on tim what you're speaking about would be the problem owner is the ultimate user at the end market or else that if they're doing some internal innovation it may be with the user um, i would like to give an example some time ago tim um, and uh, uh, participants uh, i was involved in a leadership development program uh, this about this about good uh, 11 years ago uh, with apparel company and as part of that um, they there's one particular team they want to do a project to um, come out with a better tech pack display system so that is where all the technical specifications are displayed uh, um, to all the people uh, on the floor the team members on the floor they had they came out with a, a, a within quotes brilliant way to explore and all that and ultimately they went and installed it and uh, two weeks later they had to push it back uh, take it back and say okay look this is not working and i uh, remember them they were frustrated and saying okay look that means maybe we did a fantastic job and unfortunately all these people they didn't want to use it and then the the whole project was shelved uh, but now with a hindsight of understanding 
deeper into this concept of desirability, understand the problem. The issue with that particular team who was innovating for an uh, internal uh, issue is that they were trying to do what is viable and feasible, but they did not go up to the level of the real problem owners to check, look, what is your real problem? What is What should we solve for you? They did not have that insight. They did something that thinking, okay, this is what we can do. They were very proud about what they did, but ultimately uh, that initiative is a failure. I believe all the participants who are here, you may have done this sort of uh, uh, innovations. And then some of you may have, uh, they may have been successful, but it, again, some of them may have not been successful. Um, the biggest problem about innovation is that innovations do fail simply because that we are not solving problem owners' real issues. Uh, Tim, with your experience when it comes to working with large apparel brands, have you had uh, those type of experiences as well where you did something but anyhow ultimately things did uh, not go as the way you wanted to? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think the, the 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 recognizing that not every idea will be successful is is part of innovation. But I think, you know, a similar story of uh, of of not um, really getting to the root of what the problem was and understanding the the the, the users' uh, needs was was something that I faced when when I joined um, Speedo and with the the. The, the whole initiative behind uh, Faskin Laser Racer X, where we, we revisited what the value proposition was by starting with the, uh, the, the, the swimmers. Okay. We, 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 we did a completely fresh start. The previous um, race suit, which was worn at the, the, the 2012 Olympics, uh, was an incredible uh, technical suit, uh, the, the, the FS3. Um, from a from an, a you know a construction point of view and a parallel point of view, um, it was remarkable. Um, the 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 qualities that that suit had were were spectacular. Um, however, it didn't. We didn't continue with uh, the the that suit as a, as a lineage because the the athletes didn't didn't connect with it. It didn't didn't feel right for the athletes. Um, and, and I think that was, that was the, the missing component that were, was critical to this being a successful product. The product is there to serve the, the user. Um, and, and so what we did is we, we went back to, to the drawing board and we went back to, 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 to basics almost and sort of said, right, let's, let's really find out what it is that these athletes are looking for and understand what is missing and understand what they value, what, what exists that they really wanna retain, but what is it that in all of the options that they have available, they wish they could have and don't have. And, and by starting with un that understanding of what the users were looking for, uh, it quickly became apparent that feel uh, was, was very important to, to these elite athletes. And it's remarkable what they can, they can feel. Uh, I mean, we when we went through the development, we would be adjusting seams, you know, millimeters. And and when we tested with the, the the athletes, they could tell whether the seam had been adjusted and moved back, or they could tell whether we had adjusted the fabric uh, tensile strength slightly. So, it, it was an incredible feedback loop that we had with with these coaches and these athletes. But that feel was something that that quickly rose to, to the top as a priority. Mm. Yes, the suit needed to perform and yes, it needed to make them actually uh, help them swim faster, but it also needed to make them feel faster. And um, that was something that we wouldn't have ever had as an insight. And, and that, that feature would not have been, been included in the product had we not had that time with, with the users. So I believe the desirability means that um, they will say logically, functionally, yes, this is something that I need. But in the same time, the feel factor, wow, this is fantastic that I feel fully excited to use this, wear this. That's what we call the desirability. So this is one of the bigger shifts that I would like all our colleagues from the apparel industry to ask. If you are innovating, if you are doing any innovation, related initiatives who's the problem what's the problem that you're trying to solve and then if we have the idea to 
solve it, would they be excited simply because of the logical reasons? But in the same time, would they be excited to uh, use the product and then continue to use the service? If it is so, then we look at what you call the desirability. And uh, then comes the feasibility and viability. I believe if we try to, our typical approach to innovation had been from based on what I have experienced personally and then uh, as a trainer and a consultant um, for many industries and then also with apparel industries, we are fantastic when it comes to saying, okay, look, that means we can do this. Sorry, I switched on to uh, Singhalese. Look, uh, so we, this is what we can do. Then they, they, they start working on that particular idea. So, innovation is innovation is solving problems with a unique solution in order to bring new value and then making sure that you do that. And in order to do this, you got to look at innovation more from all these three spaces, uh, viability, feasibility, and desirability. Absolutely. Uh, so now, how can we bring this in at a practical level? Yeah, this, this is all this concept is fine. So how mm -hmm. can we bring this in uh, to an organization? Yeah, so I think um, the, the the best way is to be really upfront and honest with, with how um, you as a team or you as an organization are, are operating. And, and so I think it's also worth recognizing that most businesses, this isn't, this isn't unique, the, the, this isn't just one company that is, that is facing this. Most businesses um, tend to fall in love with their solution rather than the problem, as we've just said. Um, and that's because companies and businesses structure themselves around delivering a solution um, to a problem. And then they grow that capability and they grow that expertise. And then they become really good at solving that particular solution. And the bigger the company or the longer the company has been around, the more expertise gets built around building these solutions. And, and it becomes very difficult to then break away from delivering really good solutions. And so um, the, other, the other important um, factor is that most uh, projects, most initiatives will have a, a time factor that is uh, paramount. Um, yes, costs are gonna be the, uh, you know, no doubt one of the, 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 the criteria that is included, but time tends to also find its way into the, the, the pressure of, of what success looks like. And so most new product development or, or new initiatives tend to operate in some form. Um, I've simplified it very much here, but it's identifying what the problem is. Let's, let's draft that problem in a brief yeah. and then let's quickly move to the solution. And I think it's, it's worth companies being, being honest with themselves and saying when they draft that brief, do they already have a solution in mind? And you'll find that uh, the majority of time, the brief will include some form of indicating what solution is going to be desirable. And so this is because you can develop that solution based on your expertise, based on your know-how. You can develop it quicker. You can produce it more reliably, uh, more efficiently, and you can launch it quicker. And, and that's how business tends to be run for, for many businesses. And what this does is it, it starts building this, this um, system which is focused around delivering solutions. And we all think that solutions are good. And, and for the most part, they are. Without solutions, remember, you need to deliver a solution and in innovation as well. But if you jump too quickly to the solution, you've, you've closed off thinking about other ideas. And so the real opportunity isn't to focus on the solution, but it's to focus on what the problem is you're trying to solve and and one company in the apparel uh, sector that is that i think has done this uh you know very well and, and in, interesting is a company called unmade uh, they're based here in the uk and what they did is they they took their expertise they took their know-how they took the the existing um, manufacturing processes but they added uh a, a couple of um secret source elements, if you like, and they added an algorithm and they added a capability that took the process and turned it on its head. Oh. So what they said is, well, you know, 
customers, consumers, they, they, they want to buy a product, but they want to buy a product that they like, that is right for them. And um, so what they, they did is they said, well, the normal process is that you design a range, you design a season, uh, you design a, a capsule, whatever it might be, you make that range, you store that range as inventory, and then you sell that range uh, throughout the season. And then you repeat. And, and that is how, uh, again, very simplified, but that is how um, you know, most uh, businesses are, are structured. And they said, well, what if we could allow the, the, the user to tweak the design slightly? Maybe they could modify the colors. Maybe if they're designing a, a, a sweater, maybe they could have different color, uh, color cuffs. Maybe they could uh, change the neckline slightly. Uh, maybe they could change the pattern that appeared on the uh, on the, the, the garment. So they they defined which variables were, were allowable within the system to be variable, and then the user was participating participating in the design of that um, that product for themselves, and then they bought it, and at the point of purchase, then the product was produced. And then delivered. So it's it's a different model. It's it's one I'm not saying is the solution to to all manufacturing, but it, it it's an interesting way that what they did is they flipped the thinking around and they said rather than just continue de developing the solution that we have, let's look at the problem and then see what solution we can come up with differently. So I've got a few slides here which I think can help illustrate I think the process that they went through, and you'll see how it's different to that very linear. Uh, need to drive uh, to a, a launch as quickly as possible. Um, so, so what unmade and and, and I think yep. others. Yep. Yes, sorry. Um, Tim, before we go further, uh, for all our participants, we would love to give a uh, who are who are here today. Uh, we want to give you a small um, uh, gift for you to check your innovation readiness. Um, so, this is some sort of a self assessment for you. It can be done online. Uh, Shamim, uh, uh, who's delivering, uh, uh, this is, we have shared a link uh, with everybody. If you go to that particular link, we have a innovation readiness assessment because that we believe the innovation is not about doing the same thing that you are doing and then tweaking it a bit more and then or else that coming out with just an idea. The innovation needs a different approach, different mindset, different um, organizational capability to deliver um, real innovation continuously that will add some strategic value to you. Um, so if you go to uh, that particular link, please click on it and then we'll share it later as well. Uh, on that particular link that you will take on to our website and then on the website, there are 17 questions that you could choose between one end to the other at the end, we will give you a report as to how good your innovation readiness of your organization is. So use that and then check it out. And if there is anything that you can give us a call anytime on not double seven three three six one three six one, 361 because that we have a couple of uh, innovation related solutions that we could present to you. Uh, Shami, would you like to, we're going in for a, 30 second commercial break. Uh, Shami, would you like to share some of the uh, solutions that we could offer based on innovation for the apparel industry?
Hey, what do you know? Do you know what's the meaning of uh, unsecret advantage? I, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, I, I'd be interested to hear how, how you came up with it. But um... the unsecret advantage is that uh, it will say that most of the innovative companies around the world, um, you name it, you know, for an example, we'll say top of the mind, uh, we'll say Apple. Uh, everyone. <clears throat> Everyone knows what they're doing at a certain level, but they can't copy it. Uh, you look at uh, some of the bigger, larger, more innovative brands uh, to the companies. We can see it. Netflix, you and their entire innovation strategy, innovation culture, everything is out over there. But it's impossible to copy. That's what we call the unsecret advantage. It's not a secret, but still an advantage so that all those things can be developed you can yield that sort of advantage over your other competitors provided that you built in that the relentless capacity to innovate at every level what you exposed earlier uh let's get back to the uh, the presentation i believe that we're having a very interesting conversation it's all about okay now all these things we need to go and make sure that we bring the design mindset what is why this design mindset for innovation uh, tip? Yeah, great. Well, obviously, as, as, a, as a designer my, myself, I'm, I'm somewhat biased to thinking that this is an interesting uh, way to, to tackle business problems. But I, I really do believe that the design mindset is one that is based on um, being open to lots of ideas, um, also not afraid to kill ideas. Um, that is part of the design process. Um, and a, a lot of the... Um, the ideas that you generate at the beginning are sometimes silly. Um, um, at worst, uh, sometimes they're they're ugly to begin with. But as a designer, you you see which elements are, are are useful, and you play on those elements, and you develop them, and you try them. But also importantly, is that you it's a very hands on exercise. Even even in today's world, which is uh, with all the computer uh, aided design tools that we have, um, still being able to uh, sketch something, whether it be on paper, whether it be on a whiteboard, or make something out of a cardboard box and, and just see something and hold it or um, bring some elements together quickly and discuss it in a physical way, um, but in a very rough way. That's how designers move ideas forward. So that's really what this design mindset is, is about. Can everyone still see the, 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 the presentation, by the way? Is that? Uh, you're going to share it again. Okay, let me... Um... Uh, so is that working? You see that? Yes. Yep. Fantastic. Great. So um, using the design mindset then to deliver uh, innovation, it, it, it is going back to, to re spending some time, really spending some time on, on understanding the problem. Um, rather than have an idea that we're desperate to get out, designers tend to um, really look at a, a problem and spend time to, to think about it in different ways and sometimes discuss it as a small group um, and just help shape, have we all understood what the problem really is? The other important phase here then is that you, you understand that problem and, and all of its permutations and who's experiencing it. Who has this problem? Who are the stakeholders involved in this problem? Um, how big is this problem? Is this a new problem or is this a problem that's shared by many or only a few? You try to really spend some time to understand the scale and scope of, of the problem itself. And only then do you start to generate ideas. And, and you notice here that we're, we're, we've got the word ideate, not solution. We don't come up with solutions, we come up with ideas. And that's what designers do. Um, you generate lots of ideas. And as I said before, some of those ideas are not very pretty to look at at the beginning, or they may sound completely uh, bizarre uh, even. But the way that you can see whether the idea has any merit is that you go through a loop, you go through a cycle. You prototype this idea, you, whether you're prototyping it on paper or you're prototyping it digitally, uh, you prototype it through post-it notes as a system, or you, you, you make a, a very rough model of it, 
But once you've got that prototype, you can test it. You, you can either test it with your, your peers um, or you can test it with a, a small audience, sample audience. You can go out into the street and, and get some feedback on it. Or you can have someone, you know, if you've designed a system, you can say, okay, we'd like you to try and perform task X. Mm. Please start. You don't, you don't guide them. You see how they use it. You know, what do they do about it? Um, and then you get that learning. You see how they are looking at your idea and you can build on that idea with their input. So you learn once you've got that testing. Now, this, this front end aspect to delivering innovation is, is essentially design thinking is, is, is how it's been uh, presented before. And, and uh, the G School at Stanford have, have this diagram to uh, explain it. And you can see that there's a lot of similarities here, empathizing, you know, understand what the problem is, they're saying define, you know, define those questions that you're going to need to ask to understand the problem, then come up with lots of ideas and you prototype and then you test and that's design thinking. So you can see that there's a, there's a, 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 a comparison here. And I know that the design thinking is something, uh, you know, the, these empathize, define, ideate, prototype and test as cornerstones is something that you're, you're very uh, familiar and, 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 and like rookie. So. Um, yeah, because that uh, design thinking uh, for all the participants, uh, the design thinking is the gold standard uh, tool for innovation around the world. The main reason is, is there, are, there have been many, if you really see it, innovation is not rocket science. But yet again, design thinking is being used extensively simply because that it can solve a couple of problems in the innovation in innovation process. Number one, the biggest challenge in the innovation process is you're scared to innovate simply because that you will lose out something for the company or else for yourself. Uh, so if you ask yourself, we got to innovate and all my myself or yourself or your colleagues, if you're a bit reluctant to innovate, why is that? It is simply because that number one reason, there are many reasons. Number one is that we are scared to fail. Design thinking can help you to minimize those failures. Minim I'm not saying eliminate. You can reduce those things simply because we are solving problems, not coming out with solutions. We are validating many a times. Now here we speak about the prototype test, learn and ideate because that innovation is all about making uh, some sort of an assumption to say, okay, look, this is going to work. But rather than being cocky with it, rather than being say, okay, look, I have this fantastic idea without doing that, we go back to the problem owners to say, okay, look, if this is so, does this solve your problem? Are you excited to use this? Are you, do you, do you have the real desire for a solution based on that? Now, that is what we do when it comes to any or any other practitioner when it comes to innovation using design thinking is you going through that validation of whether my assumption is right or wrong. That is exactly what uh, Tim has shown here, this prototype. Prototype is the low cost expression of what your idea is so that the user will be able to see, feel and experience the whole solution. Test it, learn from it. And then if required, ideate again. So we go, we iterate a couple of times. Tim, over to you. Yeah, and, and that iteration is, is key. And I think this is where the, the model uh, starts to differentiate from the, that previous model that I showed you that was very linear and driven by time where you, you have to come up with solutions and you have to develop those solutions and, and, and launch them quickly. Here, you can, you can spend some time uh, learning. And I think as long as you're gaining value from that learning, then it's, it's, it's not a waste to, to, to loop back. And I think that's an important... Uh, shift that needs to happen and that that's part of that mindset shift that yeah. it's okay to revisit ideas and it's okay to have an idea that didn't quite work as long as you learn why it didn't work it's much better to learn it didn't work when it's at a prototype stage than once you've produced a hundred thousand units of it and it's now out in the market so that's why so we have the expression of fail fast fail cheap that means exactly. if uh, innovation is failing we might as well fail today than tomorrow you might as well fail tomorrow than one year down the line. And exactly. you might as well fail with $1,000 than $100,000. Fail fast, exactly. fail cheap. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, and once you've gone through through this this loop a few times and you've started to really um, get the best ideas percolating towards the top, then then you develop it further. Um, and this is where, again, I think the, 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 the expertise and the skills and the resources available within the manufacturing sector really come to play because it's very difficult to develop these ideas without the skill sets and the expertise of manufacturers. Um, and so once the ideas have, been, have gone through this, this prototyping and learning phase, developing it and making sure that it is suitable to actually uh, then be produced um, where you've got the quality issues, you've maybe got your efficiencies start coming into play a little bit, um, but you need those skills in order to be able to eventually launch it, whether it be a product or process. Um, so that is, that is definitely, uh, those skills are definitely part of delivering innovation. Without those skills, innovation would just remain endlessly in this, this cycle of, of prototyping and, and, and ideas. So the other important thing for, for businesses then, and this is incredibly difficult, is that you need to balance these two different types of projects. And apologies for how confusing this looks. I always think this looks a little bit like, a, like an American football play about where the quarterback is gonna run. But it, effectively, it's, it's um, about recognizing that some projects that you have going through the business will be your business as usual projects. You know what the problem is, you know how to solve it, you just need to get on and do it. And maybe it's this season's version of last year's product, or maybe it's this year's uh, event that is different from last year's event because you're doing it in a different location with different attendees, but you know effectively what you need to do. So those types of projects are very much uh, core and central to the success of the business because that's your familiarity, that's where your expertise lies. But then you need to recognize that the project B type projects, which are these ones that have to be more iterative, go through more loops, go through more testing, go through more failure. Those also need to happen within an organization. <laughs> and it's that combination of both that, uh, that, that really makes a, uh, uh, an organization or a team really break through with innovation because you're able to continue to deliver today whilst preparing to deliver tomorrow. Yep. And, and that key difference is that one project is about focusing on delivering solutions and the other project is open to exploring ideas and recognizing that some of those ideas will work and some of them will not. I believe uh, this is a big shift that uh, most of the apparel sector managers that we got to do because mm -hmm. that, uh, from my experience with the uh, apparel sector, executives and they're far too busy so in innovation project that means we are we get into this russia for okay, we got to do something now and then we don't have much of time we might as well get and done over but dear colleagues the difference that we know that when it comes to innovation the probability of failures are very high some of the ideas do not work it's ultimately when you have when you have two projects failing getting on getting people buying into the third and the fourth is very difficult so that's where you invest more time on the problem space making sure that you understand uh, rather than just coming out with solutions now for an example we'll say that uh, look that means our daily stand-up meetings are taking far too much of a long time so what can we do so then i i heard uh, with one of my friends they said okay look well, let's not uh, send the senior people to the daily stand-up. We are sending a representative. Uh, that initiative was a failure after two days because that for them, they thought that the problem is with bringing the senior people into the daily stand-up and then the juniors can do better, but ultimately did not solve the, the problems that they were seeing. So if you really look at Invitation is that you need to start looking at the problem space more and then bring many ideas for trialing, for experimenting, for validation. Then the probability of you innovating rapidly would be much, much higher. Tim, over to you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I love that story as well because it's, it's something that there was a problem and a solution was proposed. And then you said within two days, they figured out that it didn't work. 
you know, that that's great. That's that's failing fast. That's failing cheap. It, it didn't take two years to, to figure out that there was problem. There was a problem with the with the solution. I also like uh, there's a quote and I can't remember who said it, but it's um, today's problems are caused by yesterday's solutions. Um, and if, if you think about it, you know, most of the problems that we face are problems that we've either made ourselves or we as an industry have, have created that we're now trying to overcome. And I think the, the best way of overcoming them is to just try, you know, come up with some ideas and try some of these out, learn what works, learn what doesn't, and then move forward and, and not be um, burdened by the fact that some ideas will not work. And that's why having this, this two-tier approach or this, this, this balance of having some continuity of reliability that what you are producing is going to work versus also having some uh, ideas that, that may not work and, and uh, allow that to happen. And you know, one, <clears throat> one example um, that shows how this can be done and, and be incredibly successful is, is Nike. Now, obviously Nike, you know, they, they, they operate in the apparel world, but I'm using a, a footwear example here because I think it's, it's a brilliant example of how Nike were able to um, discover a need that existed by their close relationship with marathon runners. They, they, they'd been working and helping uh, athletes in the marathon space for some time. And they, they began to learn what it is that those um, marathon athletes were, were looking for. What, what was working well with the solutions that existed on the market, whether they be from Nike or competitors, but what was not quite right? What, were, what did they wish they could have? And so Nike took that, the, those insights and they spent four years developing what would ultimately become the Flyknit um, technology. And what they didn't do is didn't stop producing their other products. They continued to produce the, the, the breadth of, of, of footwear. They continued to develop footwear that was for marathon runners. But in the background, they, they were working on new ideas and new technologies to solve that need that wasn't being met with existing manufacturing methods or existing approaches. So they were really able to, to balance a project that took four years and had several iterations and some didn't work and some did and some really intriguing things came out of it that, that actually planted the seed for uh, yet another project. They gained an immense amount of knowledge through that process, but they kept the lights on by continuing to produce what they were known to do and continued to, 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 to deliver those solutions for their users. And so they were able to navigate that, that, that balance. I just want to include another example of a company that has taken this design thinking uh, or component of this design thinking approach, not in the apparel industry, but in, in, in uh, electronics and homewares, uh, or the, the, the home cleaning sector. So Dyson is a, a globally uh, renowned brand. It's a market leader now, um, but they actually, Dyson actually struggled to get his idea sold into the, the established um, vacuum manufacturers because it was a new idea. It was taking, uh, um, it was rethinking the model. It was taking uh, a, a business model where a lot of the vacuum manufacturers were making money on selling the vacuum bags and his solution got away with bags. So the, 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 the existing vacuum cleaner manufacturers were thinking, well, we don't, we don't like this idea. It's actually taking something away from our business model. But what he did is he, he continued, he persevered, and he produced over 5,000 prototypes. So he was stuck in that loop for a long time of having an idea, prototyping it, learning what worked, learning what didn't work, getting that feedback and putting it into the next prototype. And he stayed in that loop for, for quite a while. Um, but when he came out of that loop, he was able to develop and produce and launch what would then become the standard for vacuum cleaners. And he became, he's now, uh, you know, Dyson is, is now a market leader in the vacuum cleaner uh, sector. And many of the other brands have actually now emulated and copied um, his ideas and his technology. So this is just to say that taking your time in that loop to prototype isn't a waste of time. It's actually a, an investment of time that enables you to come out and play 
a leading role in a category if you do it right? Yep. Um, we are, we should be done in about another three to four slides. And if you have any questions, yeah. you have two options. A, uh, you can uh, send it to us uh, on the chat. We will read it out and we'll uh, give us our views on it or else that if you think that you want to voice out your opinion, you, uh, you could raise your hand and we'll give you an opportunity and then we could do that. Uh, Tim, now in order to do this, uh, what can be done in order to bring this new way to innovate? Not a new way. This is a more of a bit of a different way to innovate rapidly. That means where you understand the problem, understand the problem owner, come out with many ideas, prototype, test, validate, do all that. What does it entail to get it done? Well, <clears throat> I think actually, uh, Ruki, you, you you have some slides that, that um, you, when we were discussing this, you, you put together and I, th I think you've summed yeah. it up brilliantly. So I'm, I'm actually gonna yeah. jump to, to, to this slide here where I think there are some, as you put it, these meta skills. And, and, and I think it is about this, this mindset shift of needing to move away from knowing what the solution is. I always find it interesting that in the English language, when you know something, you tend to say no to things because you know what works. But, but in fact, if you, if you shift that mindset and say, actually, I don't want to know what works. I want to learn how we could maybe come up with some other ideas. It's a shift. You're not the expert in the room who knows the answers. You are uh, someone in the room who has expertise who can really explore ideas. That is incredibly powerful. So that that's kind of the the, the key message I wanted to to, to share. But um, uh, I'll, I'll pass it to you to talk through your the, the, these meta skills you highlight because I I think they're absolutely spot on. So the meta skills means these are the overarching uh, skills that you need to have as an organization. It's not about individually, not, not only with the people who has to use this as part of the process to innovate. Agility is something, it is one of the most prostituted words uh, nowadays, simply because that everybody says, okay, we got to be agile. But yet again, they are not really agile. Agility means your readiness to reboot and reconfigure anything and everything that is required to get done. So that means even your structure, your processors, everything, okay, look, everything is going back. We are rebooting, we are reimagining, reinventing. That is agility. Tough, particularly in apparel industry, with my experience, it's tough to bring agility because that we are speaking about years of industry. We have a lot of industry experts has been there for 15 years, 20 years, 25, bigger mindset. And in the same time, we need to make sure that the strategic level ambiguity about innovation is not about uh, delivering an order to an order uh, or a style to a style. We need to know, okay, look that we don't know, we got to do that. And then how does this entire thing link up to adding value to the business? That is, we are connecting back to the vi uh, viability of those three circles that uh, uh, Tim spoke about. So these are the three meta skills. And then the next thing that they need to do is that if you get into the, if you vary, what are the skills that specifically that you need to apply for innovation process, uh, Tim, uh, the next uh, slide, if you could. Um, so this, we, we decided to line up this with the, uh, the whole uh, design centered uh, innovation process of empathizing, defining, ideating, prototype, and testing is all about the trend spotting, the, the trend spotting to um, the empathy plus the cultural interpretation of lifestyle uh, is key because that sometimes if you are innovating internally, what matters to, more to one of the uh, female machine operators in Colombo to Dhaka to Chittagong to Karachi to uh, we have maybe one or two people who's coming from uh, Ethiopia they would be very, very different. How can we make sure that we are solving problems for them rather than solving problems, innovating for our own ego? We got to do that. It's a huge skill to do. And then creative problem solving that we got to do. Um, one of the key things is this ideation um, team and the colleagues who are up here as of now is this idea killing because that sometimes we fall in love with our ideas. We start romancing our idea. Wow, this is the, my fantastic idea. The moment that you start doing that, you are 
killing yourself as an innovator. Your job is to, do you have the skill to kill the idea, not for the just killing it, but it again, okay, I have very valid reasons that where I have gone through several loop back from the problem owners and then can I kill it idea, kill an idea and before we start uh, going to the prototyping and also this experimentation design more at the last level. It's a huge test. How can we design experimentations? Because that way experimentation in the sense, we have an idea, we have a prototype, we need to ensure that it is working. So now for an example, you might say, okay, look, that means we need a new canteen layout. But once you have a new canteen layout, but sometimes the canteen layout may not work because people not like it. How can you create a prototype and validate whether they like it or not? How can they do it? So this is pretty key. I believe one of the key things that I'm from the apparel industry that I would like to bring is that how Adidas in 2019, they created, uh, um, they got the, the license to do the, for the Women's World Cup 2019, all the, the sports kit, the jerseys, the shoes to whatever. One of the key things that they did was that so far they have never were gone and understood the requirements of women footballers. Up to that particular point, up to 2019, all the women footballers around the world wore what was designed for men. And when they started doing that, they had a lot of input to say, okay, look, where we sweat most is not our back or not on our chest, but on our waistline. Now, that sort of an insight had not been ever been captured. And what they did was they came out with different innovative shots for the women footballers because the structure is different. And what they did was that they started doing very different type of experiments that are cool ways that they, how they tested those experimentation. That's for another date. We don't have a lot of time. So there are, these are some of the skills that you may have to build in within your organization, with the TV people who are committing for innovation on a serious note as a set of skills, because that you need different set of skills to start exploring the initial problem and then to go into prototyping, testing, and then scaling it up. It's a different ball game altogether. So, mm -hmm. so this is what we got to share. The whole idea is that you need to, as an apparel industry, we need to make sure that we create that unsecret advantage. We are so good in bringing, being innovative. We are as a habit that we innovate. Everybody knows what you're doing, but it's very difficult for us, them to catch. So that's what we wanted to do. We got, we are reminding you about the survey that you shared. You can go and check how your organization looks like uh, from, for innovation, whether your innovation readiness is good enough or not. Now, let's uh, open out uh, Shamim for any questions. If you want to innovate, uh, sorry, if you want to ask a question, send us a on the chat or else uh, we'll give you space. Open up your screen and then uh, ask a question. I, I really like the, uh, the, the survey, uh, um, Ruki, by the way, because I think it, it does help really evaluate your existing um, strengths. And I think it's, it's worth everyone recognizing that uh, we all start with existing strengths and then we can build on those strengths. We can also identify where our gaps are. Then we can really improve. So I think the survey is, is a very good survey to help identify your, your current state to understand how you can continue to improve, continue to be better at delivering uh, propositions and, and products that, uh, that users want. So a little plug for your, your um, survey there. It's in the, the link is in the chat, I see. So hopefully people Thanks, will still Questions, you can type in or else that uh, unmute your microphone and then speak up. I see that Genevieve has a, has a question. Yes, hi. <laughs> well, you said my name better than <laughs> so many people would have. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Genevieve. Hi, Jen. Um, I have a question going back. Sorry, it's going back a little and I didn't want to interrupt um, when we, we were at that page, but the page on innovation positioning, I wanted to, to just out of 
curiosity just because examples always help um, the understanding. And if you had examples of some of the, the, the rows of what could be in, a, in any type of either apparel or other product uh, from the industry, what type of examples of product could have been in some of those, um, some of those boxes? Yeah, absolutely. So let me see if I, I can just um, see if I can share that again, just so that people can see. Um, oh, it seems like I might need to have the sharing options. Uh, there we go. Sorry, technical, technical navigation here. Um, so it was the page with the shades of gray and blue. So th this one here? Yes. Yes. Or, or the other one? No, this one, this one. Okay. Um, I mean, I so it makes sense, but I'm thinking if you have examples of, you know, yes. when you're putting this together of things that have been really disruptive and or things that are just the minor change. Uh, yeah. As like absolutely. the bottom couple of uh, I'll, I'll do my best to highlight some. So um, in terms of uh, starting with the adjust at the bottom, then this is this is something where a lot of uh, brands will have um, their, their core range and you are effectively um, just adjusting the color or maybe you've, you've got a graphic that you are adjusting um, and that's the product itself. Uh, the spec of the product is, is very much the same other than a, a minor adjustment. But these are incredibly important for, for brands because these are volume uh, products that will continue to be carried by many retailers because they know what it is, they know how it sells, they can do their, their forecasting very clearly on it. Um, so that's sort of that, that, that level of adjust. Now refresh is where maybe there's a, a new, um, um, a, a slight modification to something. So this might be where you, you've changed the, the, the pocket slightly, or maybe you have uh, a different zipper or fastener um, um, to, to the pocket. And so the product is essentially the same, but there's an element or component of it that is that has changed. And that makes it a new, uh, a, a new type of product. There will be some uncertainty, you know, does this new zip perform better than the old zip? But effectively it's a zip and you know, you can, you can understand what it is that you've changed. Now, when we move to fresh, this is where it's, it's maybe um, uh, new for the company itself producing it, but the type of product exists already in the market. So this might be, um, you, maybe your competitors have, have got a version of this and now you as a brand are saying, well, actually we see that there is traction of interest for this type of product. So we're gonna do our version of it. So the product, uh, the, the, the company itself has never carried this specific SKU before, but they know what it needs to look like. They know what it, the expectations from the users are because others exist in the market. So the, all of that is, is in that, that gray area. Then we move into, it's a new offer for the company. And the distinction here is where um, you move, the reason that's moving into the innovation space is that this is where you are doing something for the first time as a company, but you don't have a reference point that you can look to directly from a competitor. You can't say, oh, this is, this is you know, a new pair of shorts and this is our version of those shorts. This is something that you're developing a new pair of shorts that have a feature or have a, a, a material application or as Rookie's example with the, the, the female kit for, for the, uh, you know, from Adidas for the footballers, this is something that you will need to create but don't have a reference, a direct reference to. So there's a lot more unknown. There's experimentation that would be required in order to get this right. And that's why I think it's moved into the innovation space because you don't know what good looks like yet. You'll need to discover it. Then in, in advancing innovation, this is a new offer for the category. So this is where you are doing something that is maybe uh, somewhat unexpected for the, for the audience. They, they, didn't, they weren't necessarily thinking that this product was gonna come about. They're delighted, hopefully, <laughs> if it's based on identifying, the, you know, your insights have identified a need, but this is something that the category didn't offer before. So what you've done here is you've launched a product that surprises in a positive way, again, hopefully, um, and addresses a need, but it's not something that 
the audience was was used to. There's, it's not, um, and the difference between advancing and pioneering is that pioneering is something that is so new that actually we have a difficult time understanding a reference point. So this is where a lot of science happens, you know, like, um, you, you know, the, the new material advancements or new uh, quantum processing in, in computers. It's at a level that you need to be an expert to understand the real value here. Uh, because it, you, you are delivering something that is so new that it's difficult for, for a layman or for a user to, to understand. So I would say most companies do not operate in the pioneering space. This is really reserved for your research labs, um, your, your two or three um, uh, technology or, or institutions that are focused on this pioneering uh, work. But advancing is often new for the category, but you could you could borrow from an adjacent category. So this is where you can take a technology that might be applicable in, uh, say, uh, the transport uh, sector and say, well, actually, the fabric that they use for um, airline seats, if we were to use that for camping equipment, it would deliver X, Y, and Z benefits. I'm not saying that's true or not. I'm just saying you've taken from one sector and you've applied it to another, and then you've, you've, you've um, advanced something in the category that didn't exist, but you've borrowed from an adjacent. Did that Thank help? you? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, is it somewhat common for, um, I guess, teams that work on innovation to overlap a few of these. Because um, I would think that we go probably from light gray to the mid blue. Uh, and when we when we work on things and then um, sometimes it's balancing, right? I, I feel like the gray will be when we think safely and we go in cautiously and we wanna make sure that our customer, you know, will accept or will agree and it may just be a, a low hanging fruit. And however, it takes time away from really playing in the blue. Um, so it's, it's, I think for us right now within the team I work with, it's figuring out like we keep wanting to, to be in blue and to try to bring really new things. And then um, it's been a difficult two years, right? All the business yeah. <laughs> with yeah. COVID and everything. I believe, uh, we, we keep like, yeah. cautiously threading in gray and that kind of, um, hinders us for really, really spending the time we need to do in that, in that loop, uh, as you mentioned earlier. So yeah, yeah, I would yeah. think that it's probably something that's quite common. It, it Jen, is. Uh, you, if I, yeah. Uh, Tim, if I add to Jen's uh, for the others, uh, I believe what you need to look at innovation is the innovation is not about a single initiative. Uh, initiative is all about you having a portfolio of initiatives that is complementing aligned across all these uh, spaces because of what you need to do is that you need to have that a if our initiative fails what's going to happen to us so you you balance how you manage the risk because the innovation is a always a, with innovation is always risky b you got to make sure that uh, some of the things that you have done maybe at a of the light blue the incremental level once you get hang of it, how can you do it more successfully, more quickly? That will help you to create that culture to get to the other level and uh, deliver. So that managing that innovation portfolio across the uh, spaces uh, is the key for your organizational success as a business. I believe that I make some sense to you, Jen. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question, uh, Tim, uh, it has come offline. How do you see your thoughts around innovation taking place when an, when an organization is more focused on manufacturing based on the brand's requirements? Sometimes rising opportunities are not within the typical spaces we operate in. So if I understand correctly, it's um, the, the, um, the brands that uh, you're, you're working with define the agenda if you like in terms of what they are are looking for and i think um i think there's an opportunity to uh, very much like the the a project which is around 
delivering your expertise with reassurance because that's what that brand has hired you for. They know that when they engage with you, they are going to get quality product um, on time and, and uh, you know, on cost. Um, but I think it, it's also an opportunity to say, right, well, we can continue to deliver this value for you, but start conversations to say, okay, what other projects are you looking at that is maybe pushing the envelope a little bit more? Whatever we do, we will not disrupt our ability to deliver project A's for you. We can continue that. So very much like Genevieve's um, challenge of how do you how do you continue operating in the gray but dabble in the blue? I think you you have the same opportunity here is you can continue to deliver the reassurance of your expertise but start seeding an opportunity to say, how about you use our expertise to explore some ideas, not deliver solutions. So I think every brand that I've worked with will have clear objectives of what their project briefs need to do because they are the defined deliverables. But every brand will also have ideas that they wish they could explore. And the reason that they don't always explore them successfully is they don't have the capacity or they don't have the capabilities internally to explore them. You as a manufacturer have different sets of capabilities and different capacities that you're able to offer as a solution. So I would suggest you have those conversations and say, how can we become an explorer partner with you, not just a producer partner with you? Hopefully that answered that. I believe uh, if you can invest on those type of relationships, uh with the brands that ultimately you are positioned to leverage some of the uh, rather than just ne negotiating for a two dollar cents or three dollar cents value you work on some other real value addition as a partnership than uh, just a contract manufacturer where they, they could shift from here to bangladesh to vietnam to ethiopia to uh, any other hotspot that is bringing up uh, I believe we have one more question that has come up. Uh, I think this is coming from uh, Muzammil uh, uh, Hussein. Uh, he said, what level of innovation is necessary for a company when there is a global recession going on? Um, well, I guess the good news is that it's global. So everyone is facing similar challenges. Um, the challenge would be greater if it was only in one one specific area, then you would be be penalized for, for having that challenge where everyone else was, was able to continue unchallenged. Um, but I think the, the, the downside of it being global is that it affects all parts of all businesses. So um, it affects, uh, you know, at the moment, uh, consumer confidence, um, the price and cost of living is increasing globally. Uh, resources are getting um, squeezed in terms of uh, production, uh, supply chains have been disrupted, and so on and so forth. So I think it's worth recognizing that the world we work and operate in today is not the world that we operated in last year, and it's not the world that we operated in certainly five years ago, pre-pandemic. Pre, um, um, but I think this is where innovation and the ability to navigate the ambiguity and to be truly agile, as Rookie, you were saying, agile is a word that gets thrown around. But if you are able to really embrace being agile, the fact that the world is different is okay because you are prepared to navigate it. If you remain rigid and try to cling to the operating model that you had before, that's I think where you face challenges. So it's really about um, recognizing that uh, some things will need to change in order for you to continue delivering to the standard that you wish to deliver, because not because your capabilities have changed, but because the context that those capabilities exist in has changed. Uh, so, but on the other, but on the other hand, uh, every chaotic situation around the world or any market brings new opportunities. I believe that is where your, um, I believe uh, the question came from uh, Hussein. Uh, Hussein, if I got, if I remember the name right, and if I got uh, got it right, it is all about your capacity to understand the trend. Well, I believe uh, uh, Tim mentioned earlier the, the, the market for, uh, re, not recycled per se, but uh, 
second hand clothing market is exploding mm-hmm. um so coming out with some of the more natural uh, um natural more sustainable solutions are much more picking up in some of the parts of the world what is your business model i believe when it comes to certain things you got to innovate at internally with the process to the product and all that i also believe that your value proposition to the uh, who your end customer would be and to the what the business model would be is the key to play the game absolutely uh, i think i have a we have another question um ramani mahendran is asking if you look at innovation pipeline going across gray to blue how a healthy pipeline look like in terms of number of projects in different zones so um so if you just repeat that or i didn't get oh, you sorry. if you look at the innovation pipeline going across gray to blue how many how a healthy pipeline looks like in terms of Oh, very good. Um, yes, so just going back to, um, <clears throat> I think it's important to um, not be too hard on yourself as an organization if you are already established to recognize that the majority of your work will be in that gray area, possibly dipping into to, to the blue. And, and that, isn't, that isn't a negative thing. That isn't a, oh, we're not delivering our full potential. Um, so I'd say, um th- there's a there's a a nice little um percentage breakdown of 70% uh should sort of be in that gray area maybe 20% in your incremental space and maybe 10% looking at advancing um like i say very 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 few companies are looking and operating in the pioneering space um i don't like to put fixed numbers to it because i think it's 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 important that you recognize your needs as a business and what you can offer your your clients and customers but the vast majority of your work will probably be continuing to do what you do well and if you do that well enough and you can change the metrics so that you can carve out some time to explore in the incremental space so you're doing something new for the first time or you're exploring something in the new to category the advancing space this is an, a product that exists in the category but you've identified a gap you've identified a need um, that could be addressed but you're not quite sure how to address it if you're able to carve out a bit of time or a team or some resource some some um, equipment time some production time and say our measures are not going to be based on 100% operating in the gray area where we know exactly what we're doing and what we're delivering but we're going to be operating you know 80% will be in that space 70% 80% whatever it might be and that remaining 20% is going to be us exploring ideas and if we don't deliver anything out of that 20% in this first year or even in the second year that's okay so i think it's important that you you rather than it be um just carving up your projects into these different spaces it's saying the measures that we're going to use what success looks like are going to be based on 80% or 70% not a full 100% of capacity always delivering everything on time within budget within um margins um uh, to my believe but there's another perspective complementary perspective to that would be uh linked to the the innovation ambition of your company and then also look at uh, where the in the innovation cycle where it would be so that you cannot just look at the pipeline per se that you need to bring in the 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 possibility of you in the innovation pipe uh, the cycle towards the success so you got to bring in a more like a traffic light system to track the things are looking good for probability of success whether the, the traffic light system is good uh, whether we are keeping the innovation on the pace that we we are keeping it because that there's no point of you having a fantastic looking product uh, project just stuck in the pipeline for x number of months so you got to bring in all these permutations to say okay look that our healthy innovation pipeline means it has a healthy traction it has a healthy traction towards delivering your innovation ambition at the time that you want 
So once you have the matrix, what we uh, Tim spoke earlier, uh, linked to that, would we give you the the real not about the pipeline, but at again your capacity to have a healthy pipeline to deliver your innovation ambition. Yes, and I think the, and it, the important thing there as well is is that traction and and as you've mentioned before about killing ideas. Just because you're operating in incremental space, you can't have pet projects that just live on, you know, continuously playing around with ideas. At some point, you need to evaluate whether that idea is going to be able to progress. And what happens is as you look further out and you play around with ideas and some of those ideas may be crazy, you learn something and that learning can filter down to the, the gray area. Um, and I think that's really important as well that uh, one of the things that, uh, that I introduced as, as a conversation when I was at Pentland is that we, we value, um, you know, three key, key um, metrics, if you like. Obviously, um, you know, sales is important, um, but let's also look at the value of brand and, and let's look at what we can do that helps promote the brand and build that relationship with consumers. They may not be top sellers. They may not be, you know, the revenue um, engines but they build that credibility and, and, and continued message of passion, passion with, the, with the user. Then the third element, which I introduced, which was a, a, a metric of learning. If you are learning something that will be of benefit to the business and the organization, maybe not this year, but maybe next year, or maybe in five years, that has a value. So how do you measure that learning capability? And that comes by having that portfolio, as Ricky just said, in terms of of exploring and having um, the space to to uh, to explore. Uh, I have one more question coming from Imtia Zawan. How do you help organizations to innovate? Identify prob. I, how do you help organizations to innovate? Identify problems to solve. Uh, so I believe Imtia is this as a training and a consulting company. If it is so, what we do is that. Uh, 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 we, particularly in some of the identified markets, uh, um, we work uh, with Tim uh, on the innovation space and then our intent is to help your capability, to enhance your capability to innovate rather than doing things for you. Because that I believe it is uh, imperative for us to build that capability and ultimately you are capable of sorting out your innovation challenges but on the other hand at a certain level if you need to have you need a shot in the arm what you could do is that we could help some of the with the some of the solutions like running hackathons to running um, innovation challenges to ideation challenges to all that shot in the arm to get things done identify some couple of problems and then uh, um, and getting things done um, fast. But what matters most is that, do you have the capability to go through A? Who's the problem? What's the problem? How do we have our unique view to the problem? And how can we generate more ideas to solve it? And how can we test these ideas? How can we experiment? How can we validate? And then at a certain level, how can we kill the idea rather than just falling in love with the ideas. So you got to have all those capabilities built in for you to have that, what we call the unsecret advantage at the organization. I believe, uh, Jess, I answered your question. Um, uh, Tim, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think, um, you know, a good place to start is, is the survey that, uh, that Ricky has, has sent out because that, understand, that helps you understand your, your current state um, and I think one of the things that, that is, is important to say is that everyone will be unique. Everyone will, will, will have a different uh, vantage point, and that's why you can offer something unique. Um, so you need to understand what that is. Um, we also use you know, multiple frameworks and, and, and some other tools that can be used to understand the skills and strengths that exist within your team and how you can play and leverage those strengths um, is something that is, is maybe uh, something you're not aware of, but the, the, the strengths are there. So one of the things we can do is help identify those strengths and then help you tap into those strengths. The other thing is to then be, be honest and truthful about where your gaps are. 
And then what can you do about those gaps? And there's, there's multiple things that you can do depending on what the gap is or where it exists and what your strengths are. So it is very much tailored. Uh, there isn't a one size fits all approach. It's, it's working with uh, individuals, working with individual teams and, and assessing what you are good at now, what you would like to be good at in the future and how you can continue your, your development journey. Um, a lot of what we do is, is helping you think about things in a different way, framing questions, getting you to come up with some different ways of thinking. Um, we don't necessarily have the answer in a bag that we say, if you buy this bag, the answer will be in it. It's very much around having a set of tools and frameworks and models and experience that we can, can work with you to, uh, to help you tap into your, your potential. So we're good, uh, Tim. I believe we overshot uh, our timing by about 17 minutes and we still have about uh, <laughs> 27 people with us. I believe that uh, talks so much about the success of the webinar. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, ladies, uh, from wherever you are. Um, uh, what we need to do is that uh, we need to make sure that we send you the recording. We send you the slide deck. We will do that uh, by tomorrow morning. And uh, we will resend you the survey link in an email to your registered email address. So you will be able to refer things and all that. And your job is to make sure that you go through and understand and connect and share it with the others. And also that uh, we will be sharing our, uh, on uh, LinkedIn or on Facebook. We are there as so 360 degrees, 361degrees.lk. Come connect with us. And I'm there as Ruki Diesel. And then Tim is there as Tim Sharp. So uh, I believe we spoke about how can we uh, embark on a rapid uh, innovation journey for the apparel industry because it's the imperative of uh, what you got to deliver. Now, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim, for spending your time, spending your energy and then your insights with us. And then for everybody, adios and bye-bye from Colombo. Thank you very much.